If you want to go to a football game and you want to see your favorite team play, you have to buy a ticket. And those who think ahead of time will buy the ticket ahead of time, maybe even a season pass, and they won't have to worry about buying a ticket or having a ticket. They'll know where they're going to sit, what row, what column, where they'll sit in relation to the field, and they don't have to worry about that and can spend their time getting ready for tailgating. The other approach is you can wait till game day and there may be somebody at the gate who has a ticket or two for sale. This, the price may be real high or it may be reasonable. They may have tickets that are together or separate, but you might be able to get a ticket there and you might not. You just never know if you wait. Those that are wise purchase a, a ticket ahead of time. Those who are in Christ have the equivalent of a ticket and some interpret in Revelation, the white stone is like a ticket. A ticket is a contract or a covenant. And the contract of that covenant or a contract of that ticket is that you know you can enter the, the stadium, you know where you're going to sit, and you know that that seat is protected for you, reserved just for you. That's the contract. And if you don't have a ticket, you have no contract, and you have no guarantee of entering or a seat to sit. Even if you get a general admission ticket, it's no guarantee of where you might get to sit. Paul was concerned that people would have an opportunity to go to heaven, and he was concerned that all people have that contract or that covenant with God. A covenant is a, an agreement that God makes, and it's one-sided. It's God says, this is what I'm going to do for you if you do this. And the uh, a covenant comes from a word for the purity. What the covenant does when God sends his covenant is to work to purify our lives. If you look at the Ten Commandments, that it was a covenant with Moses. It was how to live our lives in relation to God that was pleasing to God. And it was a righteous way of living. If you look at the Jesus' interpretation of that, of the Sermon on the Mount, same way. It's, it's how to live for God. And in Christ, it's how to live for with the help of the Holy Spirit for God in righteousness. Paul was speaking primarily in this passage to the Gentile. Most of the documents we read are uh, kind of a, to a Jewish audience because they accepted Christ first and made, got together in churches and then Gentiles began to join. But in this passage, he was in Ephesus, a port city, and there were apparently a lot of Gentiles in the church. And so he began to speak primarily to Gentiles and he mentioned their previous condition. Before they knew Christ, they were separated by, from God by sin. We know from the book of Genesis that sin separates us from God. What we do that's wrong, unrighteous, against the word of God and teachings of God, it separates us from God. We can't be close to God and living in sin. There was no hope for the Gentiles previously before they knew Christ. They didn't have a promise of God. They had no covenant they could look back on and say, you promised this. And without a Messiah, they were aliens or non-citizens of Israel. And that's their former condition. That's our former condition. We're Gentiles. And so that was our former condition. Before we knew Christ, we had no hope. No hope at all for eternal life. In Matthew 23, Jesus said, <clears throat> Concerning the Jewish people, he looked out over Jerusalem and said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together as a hen gathers her, her, her brood, her chicks, but you wouldn't have me. You didn't want to have any part of me. And this passage speaks of free will. Israel had the covenant of God, had the, the words of God, the prophets of God. They knew who God was, and yet they chose their free will to reject God. We also have free will. We can choose to not accept Jesus as our Savior. We can choose not to live for him, or we can choose him. In Christ, we can have this opportunity to choose him. In verse 12, he talked about the Gentiles were aliens of Israel. Gentiles were strangers of the covenant and promise. They had no expectation for receiving the promises of God. They had no hope. And in fact, literally... It was, you were against God. So that's where they were formerly. And, and they didn't have the covenant. 
of established by God. And we don't establish a covenant with God, even though many times in our prayers we may say, God, I'll, I'll just never ask for anything else again if I get this one thing. Or I'll do this if you give me this. That's, that's trying to form a covenant with God, and God doesn't accept those. Because he knows that down the road we'll have something else we ask for and say the same thing. We don't make a covenant with God. The covenant God makes with us is about righteousness. We can't tell God how to be righteous for we have sin in our life. We are sinners by nature and our choice. And so who are we to tell God how to be righteous? God tells us how to be righteous. And in his righteousness, we live. Secondly, Paul knew that to go to heaven, you have to be in Christ. It doesn't happen automatically. It's not just you're a good person, so you go to heaven. It's not that you're Jewish, so you go to heaven. It's not because you're a good Gentile, had good Christian parents or grandparents, or that you go to church or you give a lot or you look good or anything like that, that you go to heaven. It's that you accept him as your savior. You do that personally. You do it individually. And you ask him into your heart and in your life. In verse 13, he says, he uses the, uh, the word, but, a word that's in contrast. In contrast to what it was like not being in Christ without hope. Now there is hope in Christ. In Christ, one is one who's given his life to Christ and God's grace comes to us. We receive a gift of the Holy Spirit when we accept Christ and now we want to be in Christ. We want to live that Christian life. We want to live the righteous life of Christ. He talked about far off Gentiles or being distant spiritually now are made near by the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ that washes away sin. The outcome of the blood in verse 14 is he is our peace. And so once we were far away, we were without Christ, without hope. We had no peace in our heart. We might have had a hope of this or that, but we have no peace because we don't have real hope. And then when we ask Christ in our heart, we do have peace. There's a peace that's beyond our understanding. It's when all else is going wrong, there's still something inside that says it's okay. And we're okay because Christ is there in our life. And also make a note that even though Israel had the covenant of God, had the word of God, had the prophets of God, Israel, Israelites still had to individually choose to accept Christ by faith. It's not an automatic salvation just because they were born into a certain race of people. Number three, Paul knew that when we're in Christ, we're all one. There's a unity when we're in Christ. There's no competition between churches or people in Christianity. And so what about Presbyterian or Methodist or uh, Episcopalians or um, Pentecostals? And there are a lot of different Christian denominations. But every one of those Christian denominations, we have one thing that's dogmatic in common. And that's faith in Jesus. Salvation is by faith in Jesus. It's not by works. It's by faith. And we trust in him. And then beyond that, we have different expressions of worship. We have different doctrines we hold to as our expression of worship. But one thing in common we all have is salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ and none other. <clears throat> we don't work our way in. We accept him by faith. There's no competition with that. Israel was near to God because they had the covenant of promise. They had the revelation, the word of God. They had the prophets and the word of God is key. Now we have the word of God that we also have. And so we can study the word of God and we can also know God in a very intimate and personal way, just like Israel did when we come near in Christ. In verse 14, both groups were made one. This is one of the mysteries that Paul talked about. The mystery of Christ is that Gentiles and Jews can come together in one body, the body of Christ. And it speaks of the unity that Christ was all about. A church that's not in unity is not in expressing being in Christ. A church that's not in unity is expressing secularism, worldliness. Only when a church is working together, focusing on Jesus Christ, is it where God wants it to be. Now, some churches are in unity focusing on that individual that's causing such a problem or that individual that gives so much money that we can't offend them or some other reason to focus on an individual. And that's not being in Christ either. It's a unity centering on Christ. And you don't worry about personalities. 
because Christ is who we, we worship and he can provide what a personality can. We don't worry about who has the most money they might give us or the one who has the most contacts, the most resources. We don't worry about that because God owns it all anyway. And he'd rather have a church be a small church that's worshiping him all in one accord than a church that's outwardly putting on a big show. And so in verse 15, he talks about the law, our Torah, and this is referring to rituals and animal sacrifices. And Jesus became the sacrifice and the one worshiped. And so we come and as we observe the Lord's Supper, we observe that Jesus was our Savior, the one who died for us. And he's the one, not a bunch of sacrifices, animal sacrifices, that's been done away with. In Romans 7, Paul wrote to the Roman church and he says, the law has an effect on us because the law says, don't do this, we want to do it. The law says, do this, we don't want to do it. Paul said he struggled with that and, and it, said, it just bothered him greatly. That everything the law said, it seemed like he was trying to do something else. And that's why we need Christ because we can't keep the law. But even if you could keep the law and you've kept it perfectly, you still have a sin nature you were born with and it's that sin nature that you need a savior for. And so Christ died for that sin nature so you can have eternal life. He talked about in verse 14, the, the temple curtain, the middle wall that separated us from God. There were a couple of curtains in the temple. Some of you have a, a diagram of the temple in the back of your Bible you can look at, but there was one area in the temple for Gentiles and women. There was another section in the temple for Jewish men. And then there was a section for the priests. And then there was the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. And that was once a year on a special day that he would go in and offer special sacrifices for the atonement of Israel for a year. And so that's the curtain that was torn down. That's the curtain that was rent in two from the top down when Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished. And it's like God reached down and took that curtain from the top and just ripped it. And so now the Holy of Holies is open to all the world. It wasn't the curtain that separated Gentiles and Jews. It was the curtain that separated mankind from God that was separated. And now all of mankind has access to God through Jesus. And if we're in him, we have access to God, the most holy place. We have access to that. The two created in him, two, he took two, the Jews and Gentiles, and he made one body out of it. So if we're not right with others, particularly with other Christians, then we're not right with God. Because he's about unity. And think about your own life. Are you have, have problems with different ones? You don't like certain ones and you, you let them know it. Or you'll do things intentionally to harm someone because you don't like them. That's not being one with God. That's being out of fellowship with God. And so we need to consider our life that we're living. Are we living in unity with each other as an expression of being in unity with God? In verse 19, a reference maybe to Genesis 12, where Abraham was called out of his hometown to a place where God said, I'll show you. But he was called out of that town. He was removed from that town. He left that town. And now we are the, what the Bible calls, called out ones. In our world, we use that in a negative way. But in the Bible, it means that we are chosen to be the children of God. We are called out from the world to be separate from the world. We're to be separated from the world. And now we become I don't speak the church. Greek. It talks about the church, the called out ones to serve God and live for God. We are called out of our culture, called out from the world. We're called out of how we were raised, what we're taught to believe, what our, our close group believes. We're called out of all of that to hold on to the word of God and live for him. And we become the household of God. And verse 20 he talks about we're built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And there are some that don't believe in worshiping or, or they don't believe in studying and reading the Old Testament. They say, it's old, we don't need it. And there's a lot they don't understand. First of all, it's not Old Testament, that's just what we call it. The Jewish group calls it the Law and Prophets, and the fuller term, Law, Prophets, and Writings. 
but it's called the Law and Prophets because it's the has the law and it has what the prophets say in there. It also has writings. And so it's not an Old Testament. Also, the, um, the apostles referenced it often. You can't read one of Paul's writings without reading something from the Old Testament. And so here he talks about the, um, the apostles and prophets, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and the importance of it. You need to be reading your whole Bible. Just because you don't like a certain section or a book in the Old Testament doesn't mean that it's negated, that it's no good. We need to read the whole Word of God, the Old Testament as well as the New Testament, so we can have the full revelation of God in our life. If we say we don't want to read part of the Old Testament, we're lopping off part of the Word of God from our life. And he may have something to tell us out of that section that we need to hear. But he talked about the foundation of apostles and prophets, Old Testament and New Testament. And then in verse 22, we grow into a holy sanctuary in Christ. We're to be growing, not stagnant, not check off a box. I got saved. I was baptized. I joined the church. Now I'm good. That's not good enough. That's just stepping into the family of God. And you go from there and you start saying, now, I want to know more about this. Now that I understand the new life, I want to understand what it's all about. I was talking to a young man last week. God accepting the Lord as his Savior. And I tell him, you don't have to understand it all. And you can't understand it all right now. He said, you wouldn't even be interested if the Lord wasn't drawing you to himself. The Bible says, unless the Lord draws him to yourself, you cannot accept him. And so just because you're even thinking about the Lord means he's beginning to work in your heart to draw you to himself. But you can't understand it because you haven't been born again. You haven't had that experience of accepting Christ into your life. And when you submit to him and accept him as your savior, you'll understand the Bible in a way you never dreamed possible. And so we need to understand through our salvation experience. And Paul was writing to save people. He wasn't writing to the lost. He was writing to the church. And so he talks about we're going to grow into a holy sanctuary in our life. Now, what is the sanctuary for? It's a place to worship God. It's a manifestation of God. So if we're growing into a sanctuary, what are we going to do? We're going to be a something, somebody that's attractive to the world to come and say, I want what you have. Pray with me about my problem. Come share with me what's in your life. Explain some of the Bible to me. That's being, growing into that sanctuary or the priesthood that we have in Christ. And we can take Christ to the world. But we're to be growing so that that happens. When's the last time somebody came to you and wanted you to share with them about how to be saved? Or ask you to explain a Bible passage to them? Or ask you to tell them how, how to witness to somebody? Because they knew you knew how. And they looked at your life and they knew that you were in Christ because of the way you talked and expressed your thoughts and the actions you did. When's the last time something like that happened in your life? It should be more and more and more. And we're all old folk in here. It should be often in our lives. We should be able to look back many times where that happened because we've lived many years. So verse 23, in him, you'll become dwelling for the Holy Spirit. And when you have the Holy Spirit in your life, the Holy Spirit works and permeates all the areas of your life when, unless you lock him out. But the Holy Spirit wants to go to all the aspects of your life, your talents, your abilities, where you work, where you go, where you like to go, your friends, everything about you. The Holy Spirit wants to go in those areas and sanctify them, set them apart, so that they also reflect Christ in your life. So if you want to see your favorite team play, you have to have a ticket. And if you have a ticket, you have a guaranteed seat. When you enter the stadium, suddenly everybody has one reason for being there. And they come from all walks of life, rich, the poor, middle class, from all kinds of occupations, all kinds of education backgrounds. Everything about them is different. But as soon as they enter that stadium, everybody there has one common goal, and that's to see their team win. And you sit next to a stranger somebody that's totally different from you, you wouldn't have anything to do with outside of that stadium. But in that stadium, you have something in common. You both want to see your team win. Well, in Christ, we also have something in common. And that's what brings us together in here today. We're all different. 
some some of us get together and between times and, and enjoy being together. Sometimes there are those who we're together because we have a common task that needs to be done. And some of us are, are going in different paths. We see different people. But when we come together to worship, we have one thing in common. That is, we want to worship Jesus Christ. as an expression of what's in our heart. And we come to worship Christ and we are eager to tell people about Christ. We go back to our social circles that are more like us and we share Christ in that circle. Hopefully some of them will become Christians because of our influence and will come and worship with us again and, and it increases our body here. We live out the Christian life. In Genesis 1, the Bible says God created man in his own image or mankind. We are created in the image of God, but not the, we don't look like God looks. It's the image of his spirit, the image of his character, the image of his nature. And so when we are recreated in Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. He begins to make us into new creatures in his image to reflect the nature of God, the spirit of God, the character of God, the character of righteousness. And the Bible helps us know what that is. We receive life as Holy Spirit comes in and regenerates our lost soul. There are a lot of truths in this short passage, but it speaks to us because it's speaking to Gentiles. Those who were once far away, but now we're near because we do have the Word of God. We can read the Word of God and we can choose to do the Word of God every day in our lives.